I'm sure everyone remembers the absolute disaster of Dead Rising 4 a few years back, absolutely demolishing one of the best zombie protagonists along with the reputation of a Capcom staple series. I want to look back at its first game and what a gem it really was, and how it stood out from other zombie titles, what made it really tick, and what led to the series' eventual downfall. The game was released in 2005 and produced by Kiji Nafune, the producer of iconic series such as Mega Man, Resident Evil, Street Fighter, and how could we forget Mighty No. 9. The goal of the game was to make a zombie tile closer to its B-movie roots, corny and cheap but not without its charm and seriousness. A heavy criticism of the game faced upon announcement was that Resident Evil already existed, a big concern was that the two would be too similar as both were developed by Capcom they assured that they beat their own separate series. While Resident Evil is a very serious and dark game, Dead Rising was to be a more fun game, more focused on exploration and combat, which will become the series' cogs. Meet Frank West, photojournalist that is after a scoop in Willamette, Colorado. Arriving by helicopter, he witnesses the chaos unleashing the city. He's dropped off at the local mall and helps his pilot come back in 72 hours. So you have to uncover the truth in 3 days before it's lost forever. I can't express how much I love this setting. You're not a military man, as it's so common with zombie games, but just a normal American worker. Just a journalist looking for a story. It's Frank. Frank West. Remember that name, because the whole world's gonna know it in three days when I get the scoop. Oh, one hell of a journalist. TJ Rotolo, the voice actor for Frank, delivers great lines, doing a great job at sounding like a person with natural reaction to things, especially considering the usual zombie game voice Oops. acting. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Frank is pretty serious and really dedicated to the school, but still reacts to the world around him instead of just remaining silent and only caring about his goal. He feels very natural given the role and situation, being just an average Joe, he doesn't overreact, he doesn't act over the top, he's fairly neutral, even when he shouts, he's still not over the top and acting like a natural person. Stop right there! Do you have any idea what you've done? Why did you summon me to this place? What are you planning? Would you calm down? I don't even know what you're talking about. On the way. Come on, pronto. If it were just a riot, I doubt the military would quarantine the entire area. The moratorium on information getting out is a little extreme, in my opinion. You looking to get yourself beaten alive by zombies? What? Did you just say zombies? This is my most violent shot. Check it out. Ugh. He's even sarcastic and goofy and adds so much charm to him. I've covered wars, you know. Your uh, girlfriend sent me to find you. A hot-headed, underhanded, hotshot paparazzi with nothing better to do than to invade people's privacy. I try. You got a point? You think you can handle that, huh? Yeah. At the rooftops of the mall you meet Carlito, the main antagonist of the game, voiced by Alex Fernandez. He comes off as very careful, as if everything is going according to his plan, even when everything goes to hell later. Almost as if... everyone's already dead. I think you'd better see for yourself. This, my friend, is hell. At this point, you're not supposed to know he's the main antagonist, but the game does give some good foreshadowing with his attitude on the first encounter. What I really love about him is his outfit having the Queen's design, which is a detail that completely glances over your head. Frank enters the mall and sees the zombies up close, finally getting some closure as to what's happening to the town. He sees a man behind the gates and takes a photo of him, the zombies break in because Mrs. Boomer just opens the door for her dog along with all the zombies. Here you get a real taste of the gameplay. Frank is slow and weak. 
only being able to deliver a few punches that knocks the zombies back a bast. You need to arm yourself. Almost each and every single thing in the mall is a weapon. A random bench, a TV, a lawnmower which you can use to mow the zombies or throw it at them. You can use anything you want to your favor. If you see something, you most likely can kill something with it. This immensely works against favor, making it so much more fun than just having an arsenal of guns. Sure, you have guns, but they are the most unreliable weapons, only causing so much damage before running out, or being so slow to the point that the zombies are faster. You can't choose what you find in the mall, so you often have to wing it and just grab whatever you can. Especially since weapons can break, meaning you can never cling them to something for too long, forcing you to always have to improvise what to do and what to use. Along with that, you have an inventory, meaning you can't just carry everything you want. You have to think which weapon has the best attack, which do you really need at the moment, and ration that out with healing. Healing items in this game are food and drinks, which you can also find around the mall. As the game goes, the food becomes more scarce and rare, making you have to make calculated routes to specific areas that have a lot of food, like a supermarket, so you can restock. And if you run out of food, you might have to just deal with it, or have to eat a random bag of chips you find around. Things aren't randomly placed, which can get in the way of its own philosophy since you can just memorize where the best items are and just always get more of it. But it is a great system that works well and leads to a very interesting gameplay. You can also find books which will allow Frank to gain some perks, like 25 more PP from pictures, items last longer, and so on. They only apply as long as they are in your inventory. You can also customize Frank by getting new shoes, suits, and even glasses and being naked. It's really nice to have this feature, but it can be quite awkward in some serious cutscenes about human nature and Frank just looking ridiculous. Zombies aren't as flat as meat sacks to kill, however, and have some depth to them. Each zombie model actually has a different health, making some zombies stronger than others. And at evening 7pm, zombies become stronger, having more health, more damage, and multiplying numbers. Frank enters the security room, which the janitor Otis seals away. Brad uses the ducks to go back into the ball. Frank talks to Jessie, which introduces herself from Brad. I'm Jessie. The man you saw earlier is Brad. That's all I'm authorized to tell you. Brad is a very dominant character, using his authority to get things done as they should be. He only cares about one thing, getting the job done. Alright, I'll cover you from here. You need to stick to the shadows. Try to get close to the target, okay? And what am I supposed to do when I get close? Well, the best solution would be to shoot the guy. But if you can't do that, keep him busy dodging your bullets and stay out of trouble. Are you up to it? What? What gives? Considering the helicopter and all, we have to work together. But that doesn't mean we can tell you everything. And everything we do tell you can't necessarily be printed. Yeah, so? So, I just want you to appreciate the situation. You take Brad's tip to use the air ducts to go back into the mall, but not before the worst part of the game, Otis. <laughs> this annoyance will always bother you. He gives you a walkie-talkie and a map, and will call you during the game. When you pick up his calls, you have to be in a clear spot or you will die. You can't use weapons, you can't jump, you can't do anything but walk. If you do anything that will cause the call to end, like get attacked, Otis will call you again and complain how rude that was before continuing what he was saying. Early into the game, it isn't as much of a problem, but if you miss his calls, you will lose scoops and be unable to track them, having to rely on coming across it to be able to do it. Even though his calls can be a death sentence, you need to pick them up if you want to be able to track any scoops. And it's so often that he calls you, and there's not even an option to mute the walkie-talkie, so every time you have to hear that annoying ring call. Okay, here's the deal, Frankie. You gotta listen to me whether you like it or not. Yeah. Each scoop has a limited time, meaning that if you take too long, the scoop is lost forever. Scoops are just the game's side missions, 
It's a real challenge getting through all of them without failing the main story. Every few hours, Frank has to be in a certain place so the main story can progress, and the time window for that is incredibly limited, making you fail the story if you don't rush back to the security room, making you not only have to carefully think of a route to do all the scoops without losing too much time, but also coming back to the security time, which is a real chore given how terrible the survivors are, which I'll touch in a minute. Help me, Frank, please. <laughs> Returning to the mall, you're introduced to another of the game's features, survivors. There are 49 survivors you can save, each of them having their own little story of survival. A lady that has to watch her baby be eaten alive, a drunk man that accepts his fate to die, a woman being held hostage by a police officer. The list goes on. You can give them weapons, they will use most and will provide a gesture if they can't, like the soccer ball. They will always follow you but you can tell them to stay or go to a spot. Their AI is absolutely terrible. If you breathe, they will die. When I had to clear a path, they're getting ganged on. Hitting the zombies around them, they will get caught by a zombie. You left the area, they will die in two minutes. Doing literally anything, they will stop following you. They can't do anything on their own and will fail at being assisted at the same time. It's a horrible mess. If a survivor dies, they will come back as a zombie, unless it's off screen, then they are just dead. You can't hit them enough times to make them refuse to follow you or rejoin you. They also apparently can commit suicide, but I have no idea how to really trigger that. Some of them can use weapons and you must pick them up or hold their hands. Surprisingly, the survivors you need to pick up ends up the best to deal with since they actually give you immunity to most attacks and they're not left behind since you're always carrying them. The ones that you need to hold hands with, however, are plain annoying. Not only they refuse to fight and can't use weapons, holding their hands is incredibly janky and anything that touches them will break the hand holding and you'll have to come back for them. A few events will happen with certain survivors, some will cause immunity or have a request to ask for. It's all sold by talking to them or by just bringing them something. Saving survivors rewards you with PP, which stands for prestige points. Each survivor varies the amount, some rewards a little bit, some rewards an insane amount. The game has a level system, with PP being the experience. Your health improves, more inventory, more speed and unlockable moves, like the zombie riding, air kick and much more. And when you die you can save your stats, so when you start a new game you can carry over your level. Speaking of saving, you can save in a few places, mainly toilets and a safe house. Usually it's quite a period of time between each save, so when you die you usually might end up being devastating. Another way to gain PP is by using your camera. Just point and shoot. Each photo gains a different amount of PP, and depending on what's in the frame, it can be a great amount or nothing. There are things in the world that gives a lot of points. Certain attacks to zombies and bosses gives a lot of PP. It's a fun system to mess around with, honestly, even if it doesn't actually contribute to the game that much. Fantastic! Frank is on his way to the mall when he's scared by Jesse which hurts her ankle, Frank offers to help, assisting Brad in her place. Frank meets Brad being shot by none other than Carlito. Now we are introduced to the psychopaths, crazy people who have been heavily affected by the outbreak, who have lost grip of reality. A clown breaking down after the zombies killed everyone and there is no one to laugh at him. A police officer keeping women hostage and torturing them for their own pleasure. An insane photographer that tries to infect a man just to take a picture of him and transform into a zombie because he's jealous of your photography skills. A cult leader. They're all pretty awesome, great boss fights along with really awesome music. They're a perfect portrayal of what would really happen to people if something like this happened. Though you can kinda cheese it with guns since they're all mostly melees. And the ones that do have ranged attacks are pretty slow. They are definitely the most fun part of the game still and became iconic to the series, even if they are a bit too easily cheese. Taking care of Carlito, Frank convinces Brad to let Frank tag along and write the story, and in trade Frank will help him. It's after the man Frank took a picture of at the entrance, Dr. Barnaby. Frank and Brad find him at the entrance plaza refusing to leave until he is giving a secured way out of the ball. Frank tells Brad that they can use the chopper coming with him as a transport for them and Barnaby. Closing case 1. 
But we're not done with case 1 just yet. He has quite a few scoops right after the case ends, notably the Queens, Cletus, Kent, Sophie and Adam. The Queens are genetically muted wasps, the adult of the parasite, which when killed, kills all the zombies around it. Clit is a psychopath in the North Plaza, which is available fairly early. It's quite difficult since he's using a shotgun and can't really attack him up close. Damn, mister! Come on now! What, what are you, crazy? You want... You want guns so bad that y'all are willing to kill for him? Let me go! Hey! Please! Hey, wait! No! 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 Killing him will unlock infant shotguns. Can't ends far earlier during the day. Being a photographer, just taking pictures that gets mad at Frank for being the way. He gave some camera tutorials about certain actions rewarding some PP and special PP poses. He tells you to come back tomorrow at midday and show him your best picture. Okay, here's the deal, Frankie. You gotta go out there and take even better pictures than the ones I just showed you. You think you can handle that, huh? Yeah. The only way to get his picture in time is by rescuing Sophie, a girl being harassed by prisoner convicts, some of the most annoying psychopaths in the game, that for some reason respawn. You have to rescue her and take a picture of her panties. The picture you give to him in case 2 must be an erotica picture and the only one you can get this early in the game is of Sophie. At night, the ride in Wonderland Plaza is suddenly on and you meet Adam there, an absolute fan favorite. <laughs> Besides having a nice story of going insane from not having an audience, he has one of the hardest battles in the game, which is almost really tough to cheese because he just causes so much damage. Even with New Game Plus, his damage is just insane. However, when you defeat him, you can break the entire game. Introducing the Mini Chainsaw. Scrap everything I said about rationing out your weapons, food, and having to get items on the go. The damage of this weapon is so fucking insane. You can literally defeat the main bosses in 3 to 5 hits. Sure, it breaks relatively fast. But if you stock up on the box, it basically will never break. But Abigail, you say. Adam only drops one Mini Chainsaw. Doesn't that mean when it breaks you must resort to something else? It's a responsible weapon. Leave the area, come back, congrats. You have an infinite of the highest damaging weapon in the game that can last up to 2000 plus hits. Sure, it could break, but you just pull out another one. Because why wouldn't you just carry a load of these? Using this weapon basically removes all the challenge from combat since you can just mow down every zombie with ease. I can see people will say, why are you complaining about it? If it's too OP, why don't you just stop using it? And to that I say, why wouldn't I use it? The game just hands me a powerful weapon that basically lasts forever. What would be my reason not take advantage of its own features? What in the goddamn?
After a long wait for the case to start, the gang spots the professor being kidnapped on the cameras by none other Carlito. Carlito ties the professor to be eaten by zombies. You take care of Carlito and rescue the professor, but Brad gets shot and he needs medicine. Frank goes to the supermarket in North Plaza. I think now it's a good time to bring up the cutscenes and how cinematically pleasing they are. Always having these close-up shots with a slight shake, almost if a person was handling the camera and zooming into people. He adds so much more tensity to the scenes and can even add to the character's expression and make me feel uneasy. Frank meets the store owner, Steve, a manager that just went absolutely insane, thinking anyone that comes by is there to vandalize his store. In case one, you can even meet a man that Steve attacked and injured. He has some of the best voice acting in the game. Every time a psychopath is on screen, you can see the love and passion these people had for these characters. From the corny but expressive voice acting, to the vivid and energetic animation, fully expressing these people's insanity. I need medicine. Hurt! That's just what this bitch said when she came to vandalize my store! I don't take kindly to vandalism. I won't allow it! Listen to me. And listen good, partner. I don't allow vandalism in my store! Steve kidnapped this girl, which is also there for Madison because someone was shot. Frank kills him, wakes the girl up, finally gets a good look at her face and realizes she's the girl he saw back at the entrance. She wakes up and shouts something about Santa Cabeza and runs off. Frank brings the Madison to Brad and well, th that's case too. The you know. case only gets shorter and shorter from here. All the side content available is a huge risk since the time frame for case 3 is incredibly tight and it's too much of a gamble. Only what I managed to do is the lover scoop in which a man is badly wounded and his wife refuses to leave him. You can take them with you, but the wife will not follow you, she will only follow her husband. It's just really nice when games have some character traits creep into gameplay in subtle ways like that. It's almost too tiring for the next case to start. You either go around the mall, waste resources, might find a survivor or two, or just wait in the room until the case starts. In this instance, it's my own choice to wait, but while waiting for case 2 to start is the longest pain possible because I had done all the scoops available and still had like 30 minutes to go. That can't be good. Frank mentions Santa Cabeza to Jesse, which the professor hears and gets mad about it. I thought Santa Cabeza was over and done with. You plan to dispense justice now? Calm down, Dr. Burnaby. We're only following orders. We have to protect- You want the fucking ball? Oi, stop shouting, dude. Shut up, Jenny! Shut up, Jenny! your fucking dice box out your phone, son! Call up and I'll fuck you up! I take it you know what Santa Cabeza is. Am I right? He isn't very comfortable with Frank taking pictures, so Jesse closes the door on him. I haven't talked much about Jesse because she doesn't get that much screen time as Isabella or Brad. She's still a nice character. She's kind of a bitch, often being short or rude with Frank, only really asking him what she needs and nothing else. I offered to help her, but she took off. Can't really blame her for running from a guy with your looks. Yeah. Nice camera. Are you a photographer? As a matter of fact, I am. Frank West, photojournalist. Could you show me some pictures, Frank? Sally, this is where the case ends, but thankfully there is quite some side content here. 
There are two girls right outside the storage. One of them pushed the other to the zombies to distract them so they wouldn't eat her. There's Ronald, a hungry man looking for food. If you feed him, he'll come to the safe house. Later in the game, he'll revolt and try to escape to find more food because he eats the entire stock that was made for everyone to share. You give him food and it's fine. You can progress Kent school. If you give him a bad picture, he'll just laugh at you and leave. <laughs> oh, Frank. Oh, Frank. How can you even show me crap like this? Oh, you know, I really don't think you're cut out for this. <laughs> oh, I can't stop laughing. <laughs> If it's a good picture, he'll get jealous and tell you to come back tomorrow by noon. Beginner's luck. That's all. Let's have one more. Just one more contest, Frank! Be here tomorrow at noon. We'll settle this. There's also Cliff, a Vietnam veteran that lost his granddaughter to the zombies and went insane, kidnapping three people and killing several others, going through the vents to stay out of sight. Name and rank, soldier! You can't tell me, can you, fella? Oh yeah, I know why. It's because you're Viet Cong. I'm right. Aren't I? You are nothing but a filthy communist! My granddaughter... She was done in by those damn zombies. When I heard her scream... I just lost it. Everything went white suddenly. The war, it wasn't over. This is my favorite psychopath, having a really tough battle with him going through the vents to a random spot. You can't just kill him in one go like most psychopaths. But that's kinda it for case 3. Two trucks having sex. Two trucks having sex. Those two trucks. They couldn't be. Frank spots the girl he was after in the cameras, back at the supermarket again. He goes there to meet her, but she's not up for talking. She's a pretty tough battle, mostly because it's hard to hit her with melee, so you have to resort to guns, which are incredibly clunky and terrible. You have to aim with a left analog stick, which is just awkward and stiff. Defeating her, she promises Frank if he comes back at midnight she'll bring Carlito to him and give him an interview and all the answers he wants, concluding case 4. How much do you already know? Have you called for help? Hold your horses, babe. I'm the one asking the questions here. What is Santa Cabeza, and how is it connected to all this? The zombies were created by you, not us. That's what Carlito wants you all to know. If you return to the safe house later, he'll trigger a cutscene in which Frank asks them what they learned from the professor. 
He told Jesse that Santa Cabeza was the head of the South American drug trade, that the zombies is the result of their drugs. Frank doesn't buy the story because they will have nothing to gain from making zombies and essentially killing everyone. That somebody spread a bunch of zombie drugs around Willamette? For what? What would making the dead come to life accomplish? They're terrorists. Don't try to explain their actions with logic. I've analyzed the drug in question and I've reported my findings to the government. <coughs> that must be what set them off. <coughs> they, they didn't want to be <coughs> exposed. <coughs> I've I've told you everything I know. Now get me out of here. Before the case starts, there's the Above the Law School featuring Joe Slade, which has some of the most fun voice acting in the game. What have we here? Looks like you lured another man in here, you little whore! Shut your pie hole! If you try to interfere with official police business, start with you before I get to her! She's a police officer that kidnaps four girls and punishes them, treating them as whores. You know, the usual cop stuff. I'm sure she has a fun battle, but it literally lasted seconds for me, so I can't even tell. Otis gives you three consecutive calls about survivors in the entrance plaza. Arriving there, you meet the American family, three snipers psychopath. They're not memorable as Adam or Cliff, but they're still entertaining. They're a bit tough considering all three have sniper rifles, and you have to cross half of the entrance plaza to reach them. The younger son, Thomas, didn't really want to shoot you, while the other son, Jack, just wants to blow your fucking head off, and the dad is just shouting at his kids. Truly American. Using a firearm for self-defense is our god-given right as Americans, Thomas. They're harassing a guy from the distance, he curls up and hides inside a shop. After taking care of the snipers, you can rescue him to the safe house. There's an old man in the antique shop. He's so hopeless in life that he hides away in an antique shop, so if he dies, he can die appreciating art. Frank brings it down to him that these are all fake, even though the katanas there sure can slice people in half. But I digress. He tells the man that if he comes to the safe house, he gets to go to real museums and see the real deal. And surely enough, he comes with Frank. He later asks Frank for wine because everyone is on edge and some alcohol would help. There's also a scoop with some ladies. One of them is a kid's shop and asks Frank to help her find her friend. You take her to her friend and they'll follow you to the safe house. At the Waterland Plaza, you can find two survivors hanging from a big bunny. If you kill all the zombies around them and throw something at them, they will fall down and you can rescue them. Sometime before the main mission, when entering the Paradise Plaza, Frank encounters a cult. People are just making up insane shit about salvation and pure blood. Ah, a non-believer in our midst. If we are to achieve salvation, his blood must flow! He must be purged! Spill his blood! The blood of the heretic! 
After this event, when walking around the mall, you face random cultists. They can run up to you with dynamites or just stab you to death. They can also gas you and take all your items away. You have to fight a whole gang of them to escape. And all you have is your fists and things laying around. And there is no hidden items around. A bit rude to put that knife in my chest, isn't it, bro? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank comes to the spot he and Isabella are supposed to meet. She suddenly barges in being attacked by a zombie. Frank saves her, but she's bleeding. He thinks it's from a zombie bite, but she was actually shot by Carlito. In the end, Carlito wasn't very happy about giving Frank an interview and shot Isabella. He doesn't trust anyone. He shot you? He didn't mean to. He was upset. I don't know what he'll do next. Hey. Hey. Damn. Frank rescues her. In rescuing her, Carlo makes an announcement begging for her to come back to him. Isabella. I'm so sorry. I never meant to shoot you. Now I've gone and hurt you. Please. Forgive me. Please come back to me. I know you can hear me, Isabella! I'm sorry you had to get wrapped up in all this. But you know. You know I'm right. Come back to me, Isabella. There are still things you need to do. I can't do this without you. Please. I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. Really showing his character that to him all that matters is the goal and his sister. But ultimately his goal is above all else, as you'll see later even above himself. At a safe house, Jesse takes care of her wound. Brad is surprised by all this, and the case is over. What in the hell is going on here? I mean, does this have anything to do with that announcement earlier? I don't know much more than you at this point, okay? But he shot her, I can tell you that. And just so you know, that would be the same guy that shot you. What's he after? What's his ultimate goal? I don't know. But according to her, his plan isn't over. Not yet. Now Frank is just waiting for her to recover so they can all get answers. When rescuing Isabella, you find Kendall, a guy with a shotgun. You take him to the safe house and later in the game he gets sick of waiting and starts to revolt, saying he'll leave. But you call him down, talk him into waiting for the chopper. After rescuing Isabella, you can have your showdown with a cult leader, Sean Keenan. Those who reject salvation embrace ignorance. Do you like my sword, 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 my diamond sword, sword, you cannot afford- Everyone, we have an announcement to make. I love Jesus and my mom. The atmosphere for this fight is really awesome, along with the music and his design. It really portrays those insane doomsday cult leaders. This goes makes no sense, and I just don't understand what's his point even, but I think that's the beauty of it. He's just insane and got a bunch of insane people to join him. I haven't really brought it up, but the menus of this game are really cool. They all have this cool news TV show aesthetic and it gives it so much charm. Also, after defeating Isabelle in case 4, you unlock vehicles, which are incredibly useful outside, not so much inside. It's a whole lot of fun to just drive around and smash a bunch of zombies, but inside you'll be crashing so much the vehicle will break.
Back at the safe house, Brad is interrogating Isabella about Santa Cabeza. She spills the beans that in reality Santa Cabeza did not have a drug trade, but actually an American research facility. They were studying a parasite that could turn dead into living, and the research was led by Dr. Burnaby. If you don't believe me, just ask the man who was in charge of that research, the head of the Santa Cabeza Livestock Research Facility, Dr. Burnaby! Turns out Barnaby is turning to a zombie. He confessed that he really was the head of research in Santa Cabeza, that they were looking for ways to reduce the cost of meat production by mass producing cow. Do you have any idea how much meat Americans consume in a single day? <coughs> that research was absolutely necessary! With that, case 6 is over, Sally is packed with side content. One day, in my village, the people turned into zombies. Those damn wasps. They escaped from the lab. It wasn't long before they got to work. Some spread. The army was called in. They killed everyone. There's Gil in the food court just drinking his sorrows away, waiting for death. You can eventually convince him to come into the safe house. There's Psychopath Paul, a really fun one. He's just an insecure guy, so overwhelmed by being made fun of that he just thinks everyone is making fun of him. Drag him to hold two women hostages and attack Frank. Oh, who, who's there? Stay, stay back! Stay back! Get, get in closer and I'll, I'll light this place up! I suppose you came here to laugh at me too! What makes this psychopath really stand out, however, is that after you defeat him, he will catch on fire and you can set out the fire and rescue him. He comes back to his senses and realizes what he did was fucked. Later in the game, he'll ask Frank not to tell anyone about what happened. And in trade, Frank can get infinite molotovs. They're, they're great, but it's still a pain in the ass to end things in this game. So it's really by preference. Move. Fantastic! Holy shit, we're finally on the good cases. Leading to case 7, Corrido keeps using the mall speakers to apologize to Isabella, claiming that this is the last resort. Ends up, Carrito planned that if he were ever to be cornered, He'd leak gas into the maintenance tunnels and blow up the bombs to destroy the mall and use the explosion as a way to get the parasite onto the atmosphere and infect the whole world. Ozzy no one is having any that shit and Frank is out to stop it. There's a chance we could stop the explosion. Let's do it. You're finally introduced to the maintenance tunnels. Throughout the game you find doors that are locked and require the maintenance tunnels keys to unlock. How it is is a shortcut tunnel through the areas. 
instead of having to take long walks, you can just take the tunnel. However, it's the area with the highest number of zombies, always requiring you to use a vehicle to crush them all or massacre your way through, which is what I did back in case 1. Out of tunnels, Carlos is so batshit insane to go through with his message that he chases you through the tunnels and throw grenades at you. This is his last fight and almost the second toughest psychopath in the game. Not only he's obnoxious, spending 3 grenades at the player, He's in a truck, he can easily dodge your attacks, and it's really hard getting hits on him. He can also run you over repeatedly, which if you have no idea how to escape, he can lead straight to a game over. You can actually kill him, well more like just crash his truck and Brad will do the killing off screen. I'm gonna go after him. You get those bombs outside, Frank. Once you get all the bombs, Frank will throw them outside where it can safely explode without taking everyone with it. However, it is not the only outcome of this. You see, this game has multiple endings. And the worst ending, ending F, is possible to get here, in which you don't get rid of the bombs, resulting in the world never knowing the truth of these incidents and the whole US having zombie outbreaks. If you do succeed at getting rid of the bombs, it cuts to Brad fighting Carlito, which Brad is almost out of ammo and just takes his last shots at Carlito. The two fight but Carlito outsmarts Brad and locks him out. Bomb's over and done with. Brad went after Carlito. Copy. Report back here, Frank. Yeah. If you return to the tunnels, Frank can find Brad at his worst. Almost a very dominant and strong man, has become nothing but an afraid zombie meal. With Brad's death, his last wish is just to never tell Jesse of his death. Frank's reaction to his death and Brad's voice makes this scene just outstanding. Doesn't hurt. Not even a little. I'm already dead. Frank. Don't tell Jesse about this. This game may not have the character depths of Kino Hearts or Red Dead Redemption. I got some jelly beans. But for what it is, it's really good. These people met in a horrible, unfortunate situation, and Brad kept them safe 
together and die trying to stop a terrorist to save the world. In the end, the only thing he doesn't want is Jesse to be sad about his death. It's a little throughout the game, if you talk to Brad, that him and Jesse have been companions for a long time, so it only makes sense that he doesn't want her to know his death, especially under these circumstances. What makes this even better is that you can completely miss this. The case ends with a door being locked and Frank outside of the tunnels. When first playing the game, I completely missed it and went to do other scoops, and was asking myself what happened to Brad and where he was. Only in my second playthrough, after I learned where I can get the tunnel keys, which is the room where Carlito was by the way, that I found Brad at his last moment. Which only makes this moment better. With the case out of the way, there's three survivors. Amanda seems to be sick, which I can only assume he's been infected. A lady named Simone, she has been bitten and just giving up on hope. But Frank lifts her spirits by telling her about Isabella and how she might know how to save someone from turning into a zombie. Later, she'll ask Frank for a gun in case she turns into a zombie. Lastly, Susan voices Shisuke. She's an old lady surrounded by zombies and needs Frank's help to, to the safe room. Sorry, Susan. At the same time the bombs are happening, there's Ken's last school, which there's two outcomes. If you arrive after 12.05, he'll be excited to show you his newest picture of a man being attacked by a parasite. He pulls out his gun, takes all of your items, and chains you up to get all the zombies riled up, and just use you as a little entertainment for himself. This fight is pretty hard, and in all honesty, my favorite psychopath. I know I said Cliff is, but Ken is beyond that. Listen, Mr. West, I... I owe you an apology. It looks like you're a pro after all, you know? If I would have known that, I'd have taken pictures like this from the start. Ha! How you like Amogus. You see, I think outside the box. And the best part is, I'm just getting started. <laughs> I'm gonna tie you up nice and tight. Get the zombies all riled up. <laughs> Not only you're fucked because you have no items, you have a limited area you can walk due to this chain, and Kank deals a lot of damage. At first, I considered this battle impossible. It is possible to do it, it just requires careful moves and to just use the bowling ball that can be found in the area. You can really cheese it by giving a mini chainsaw to a survivor, trigger a fight, then have the survivor be your delivery man with the chainsaw and use that against Kent. If you arrive at the scene between midday and 12.05, you meet Kent about to take the picture he showed you, kidnapping a man and about force feeding him the parasite. Obviously, Frank is letting him infect an innocent man and kills the parasite. Making Kent mad and you two fight. Ah, Frankie, good timing. I was uh, just about to shoot my Mwah! piece de resistance. <laughs> I'm gonna capture on film the exact moment that a human being crosses into zombiehood. This is a much easier fight in comparison with the other fight, but it's still a really good one, even if it's short due to this god of a weapon. The only real difference between these two is the fight, because the ending is still the same. You're just naked in one. Do it, Frank. Take my picture. It'll look great on your mantle. Kent is the best psychopath in question of character. All the psychopaths are some sort of joke, either tell or show their story, you fight and they die. Not counting Carlito, since he's the antagonist and shouldn't count in this discussion. 
On the other hand, Kent not only has one of the best voice acting in the game, he's a recurring character always challenging Frank or mocking him. He's an asshole and I love him for that. You grow an attachment to him, and finally getting to the end of his scoop, which besides the main story is the only multi-part scoop in the game, is really satisfying and a bit sad. Because when I first played, I had hoped that I'd be able to bring him to the safe house. But in the end, he just went insane like everyone else. As soon as Brad gets his hands on that terrorist, I guess it'll be case closed, huh? No. Uh. The gang decides to go to Carlos hideout to check his laptop and see if he has any more plans. Without a doubt, this is the worst scoop in the game. It's just a really boring escort mission. You have to take Isabella from the safe house all the way to the north plaza to his hideout. She wouldn't even follow you, you have to follow her. Though that does mean you can go to different areas without her dying in two minutes. Especially since a bit after you start to ask her, Otis will tell you to come back to the safe house. In case one, there was an ask her with Brad that you follow him to Barnaby, but that time you could just go to the goal without Brad and it'd be fine. With Isabella, she needs to be at the hideout for you to proceed, so you actually need to ask her. her. Thankfully, she just runs right through the zombies and doesn't keep getting hit. I think she's immune to grab attacks from the zombies. Also at the hideout, Isabella is trying to crack the laptop, which is connected to a Jimmy device, meaning if they unlock the laptop, they can call for rescue. Jessie calls Frank about something she saw on the cameras, so you're off to see her. I'll try words we both might know. Family stuff. Things like that. She spots on the camera that Carlito has been kidnapped by the Butcher, so you're off to save him. The Butcher is hanging Carlito. The Butcher has a good voice acting, but he's just a crazy butcher. The funniest thing about this whole scene is that Frank is so used to dealing with crazy people that he's just rolling with her logic. That guy over there. I, I mean, uh, that meat? Um. Oh, this is good meat, huh? The battle is tough, only because he has a lot of health. Many you can't just one-shot him. He nearly killed me. Trust me, I'm a butcher. <laughs> Once the butcher is dealt with, Frank demands the password from Carlito, and Carlito responds with the best line in the game. Hey, aren't zombies great? I mean, all they do is eat and eat. And eat, growing in number, just like you good, red, white, and blue Americans. <coughs> As Carlyle dies, he gives Frank his necklace to give to Isabella. It's not over. He's dead. Oh. All he worried about was you in the end. She finally discovers the password thanks to Carlos' necklace. Hachamama. 
With the jammer disabled, Jesse calls HQ to report the situation. They refuse her request and are sending special forces at midnight to clean up the place and kill everyone to hide the truth of what happened. HQ's decided to ignore us. What? What do you mean, ignore us? I contacted headquarters, but... The government has decided to deny all knowledge of what happened here. The special forces have a talk with Jesse. Offering her freedom as long as she stays quiet about what happened to Willamette. Well, she turns into a zombie and kills the officer. If you return to the safe house, Frank will find the dead officers and you can find zombie Jesse. All bloody and monstrous. The game will actually give you an achievement for taking a photo of her. Nice. At midnight, the special forces comes in and starts eliminating everyone, turning everything to what happened to Santa Cabeza. Otis leaves alone in the safe house saying that they took everyone and Otis stole a chopper. Okay, so this is literally the worst part of the whole game. You have to wait from midnight to midday or whatever for the chopper to come. No scoops, no survivors to save, and the mall is infested with special forces. Why would you leave the safe house? Which is now at Carlos hideout. Seriously, why would you go out if all that will happen is that you fight the military? You have to wait so fucking long in the stupid room waiting for you to hit 10 a.m. to talk to Isabella. Trust me, this matters for aiding A. And then wait until the chopper arrives at midday or whatever. I even checked the weekend to be sure. There's literally nothing that can be done. You either sit and wait or you just go out and do nothing while killing the officers. I've been having in the background sped up footage this entire wait time. This is how long it is. This part just sucks. At least at the other times when waiting for the scoop to start, you can go prepare for the next scoop, save your survivor, maybe even save an unmarked survivor. Go fight psychopaths. I can understand why back at case 1 you have to wait so long till case 2 starts. That's because it lets you roam free and explore the mall and learn its layout and the location of things. What's the reason here? You've played the whole game by now. And all you're doing is sitting and waiting or going out and dying. What's the point? Worst of all, at 10 a.m. the special forces are done cleaning up the mall and you get to see their leader. After that, there's no enemies in the whole place. It gives off a really ominous vibe. You've always seen the zombies around no matter what. Seeing the whole place empty makes it feel truly dead. And it's a really great way to end the game. However, you still have to wait 2 more hours. Which mind you, there's not even enemies in the mode, no military or zombies, meaning you literally fucking stand there and wait. With that wank disaster out of the way, the rest of the enemies can be acquired here. In the E, you have to not solve the cases and not be at the helipad in time. Otis will rescue everyone, yes, the quote unquote bad ending, the survivors survive, but not be able to find Frank, so he's left behind and the truth dies with him. Ending D, These nuts. you have to be kidnapped by the special forces around the time that the helicopter arrives. Frank is just taken away by them. Ending C, Dummies. you have to either solve the cases and not talk to Isabella at 10 a.m. or solve all the cases and not be at the helipad in time. Ed, the helicopter man, can't find Frank and is killed by a zombie. I haven't brought up Ed at all because he doesn't matter at all really. But I need to mention what a fun voice he has and what a nice character he is. I really wish he'd be more predominant in the story. That son of a bitch made it. <gasps> that must mean he got his scoop. I can't wait to get my share of the take. <laughs> hey, 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 hey! I'm over here! Ending B. Don't solve any of the cases and be at the helipad in time. Frank will board the helicopter and bring in all the survivors. Yes, the ending which literally everyone, including Brandon and Jesse, survives is not the best ending. Ending A, which is the canon ending. Solve all cases, talk to Isabel at 10 a.m. and be at the helipad in time. Frank will be there for the chopper, but Ed is attacked by a zombie and crashes. With no hope of escaping, Frank falls to his knees and gives up as the zombies approach. The credits are nice, all the Ds have the zombie from the logo, he also has a kick-ass song, 
which is funnily enough very fitting for the government's attitude in the game. Once the credits are done, the game will show your PP and how I did, allowing you to see all the survivors saved. Um, as you can see, I didn't save that many. In fact, I did most of the killing. You can see the points you got from photos, and that's it. That brings us right to overtime mode. After completing ending A, you unlock the main menu overtime mode, which is just filler content, I won't lie. Isabella comes to Frank's rescue at the moment he's attacked by a zombie and brings him back to the hideout. Frank had passed out because he's infected. Thankfully, Isabella knows of a way to suppress the infection and help Frank not turn for long enough for him to escape. This is a fetch quest, but funny enough, it's the most fun mission in the game. You have 24 hours to complete it or Frank will turn into a zombie. You have to just go get the items she needs for the suppressor and they're all over the wall, so it's a lot of traveling. You also get to carry over whatever items you had at the ending. And it's the only main mission that has an objective the Wonderland Plaza. Oh yeah, and the special forces are back. You know they were gone before the ending. They're really tough using guns, which has quite the kick. They're usually in groups and can easily overwhelm you. Though you can use the furniture around as cover and strike them where they're close. Works every time. They're also using small drones to look for anyone that's left alive. The zombies are also back, mostly because one of the objectives is to get 10 queens, so you need to kill zombies. It's kinda hilarious since you walk around the mall and everything's dead, but all of a sudden they're back. Overtime mode is also where Frank and Isabella's characters shine the best. Frank acting so distressed with having no hope of escaping, and Isabella just finally getting her well-deserved screen time and showing her character and her good acting. Acting like complete smartass, which is mentioned in another case that she's a doctor of some kind. I'm a medical technician. I don't know, man. I'm writing this from memory. You must have gotten yourself infected somehow. <laughs> the time between infection and zombification differs greatly from person to person. You're lucky, Frank. You seem to have a very high level of resistance. So, uh... <laughs> so what you're saying is that I get to spend longer waiting for the inevitable, is that it? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure lucky is the word I'd use. <sighs> Helicopter crashed. No one's coming to help us now. It's over for us. No matter what we do. So it's really nice her showing her smarts about medicine and using her job as a trait rather than just background. Once you get the first set of items delivered them to Isabella, Frank starts to question how she even knows it work. Have you ever made it before or is it just a theory? But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory! Ends up, she had made the suppressor before in the lab. With this, Isabella remembers that she had made 50 doses of suppressor. Finding out that Carlo had infected 50 orphans and had them be sent out to orphanages throughout the country to have them be his time bombs. So more outbreaks can happen all over America. Are you saying he infected these kids and then gave them your drug? That he made 50 little ticking time bombs? I don't know. I just don't know. It is possible though. Look at this. York, D.C., L.A., these kids are spread all over the country. If your theory is right, the entire country could be crawling with zombies by now. I don't know what's worse. That we don't know for sure, that we can't warn anyone about this. Meaning, even after stopping the bombs, killing everything with a man, and killing Carlito, he still had a plan if everything failed. The generator dies and you have to go get something to repair it, or I guess the whole generator, which is at the clock tower outside, which is where the helicopter crashed. 
Frank finds a hole in the clock tower and sees an exit, a sewer tunnel crawling with zombies. Also, with the zombies back after the first set of items delivered, the military will be fighting the zombies and it makes the scene a whole lot cooler. Now you have to get 10 of the queens, which thankfully is easy to tell which zombies hold them because they keep reaching for their back. Thank god you can use the chainsaw on this part. I haven't brought this up earlier, mostly because it's hard to find my footage for it, but in the game there's a really bad mechanic, the zombie grab. When they grab you, you have to input a set of buttons to free yourself. The problem is that as you level up, you unlock skills to get out the zombie grab easier. But it doesn't always work. Sometimes they still just push you to the ground and you have to do the quick time event. I think that's supposed to happen in case you don't put them fast enough. But it just happens so fast, even when you smash the input to escape it. Once you give all the queens to her, she injects the suppressor into Frank. Now that he won't turn into a zombie, they can finally pull out an escape. While she was making the suppression, she found a pheromone that can repel the zombies. Since she can make a zombie repellent, they will take the tunnel Frank found earlier as an escape. This part is really overwhelming. You're just going through the zombies holding Isabella's hand, which keeps letting go all the time, so this is just annoying. The zombies are all pushed back due to the pheromone. You have to keep stopping to let Isabella open the gates for you, which you're defenseless while she's at it, so you have to fight off all the zombies yourself. At the exit, the pheromone is wearing off and there's only enough to cover one of them, so Frank has to carry Isabella around. They steal a military car and get chased down by a tank, which you actually have to shoot at tank's weak spots and take it down. This part is just annoying and really out of place. You're just being spammed with drones or rockets and you have to keep shooting aiming at the weak spots and making sure to shoot the lasers whenever he aims at you. I do appreciate that they named the tank with something cool rather than just enemy or tank. Once you defeat the tank, the driver will take you down anyway and you meet Brock, the man who led the Santa Cabeza operation and is now here to clean up Willow Matt. Frank's reaction to his boastful attitude of what he did to Santa Cabeza is just one of the best lines in the game, and this is one of the best cutscenes in the game. If we had fulfilled our mission then, we wouldn't be needed here now to take care of this incident. That's all it was to you, huh? A mission. What about those innocent people who had to pay for sins committed by our government our and its inhuman research? Our mistakes have not begun with this operation. <laughs> Humanity has proven itself to be quite adept at making mistakes. Ha! Hell, it's the only thing we truly excel at. The zombies are drawing closer and surrounding the tank. As Brock is distracted by them, Frank loses a punch. And now Frank must face him off in close quarters combat. Nobody around the bush here, Brock is the worst fight in the game. You have no weapons, no healing, he will always retaliate with consecutive attacks, and he's just obnoxious. I know Ken takes all your items away, but you still have things around you to use against him. Here you have literally nothing. Even though he will always block your attacks, he's still taking damage. An easy way to deliver blows to him is by using a bug in his AI which is vulnerable when changing heights on the tank. He won't attack you and he won't block, and 90% of the time he'll just jump back up. Where's this that I paused the recording to write this part of the script, and I forgot to unpause during his battle, so he just mysteriously has nearly no health left. Brock falls to the zombies and eaten by them. Isabella is on top of the car, trying to not be caught by the zombies. At these last moments, Frank just lets out his anger with a scream. Frank and Isabella escape Willamette, it's never stated how. Frank publishes the story and the truth of what happened, but the US denies all responsibility and says they had something to do with the research facility. The public believes the government, of course, and soon forgets about the incident in Willamette, ending the game with the best line in the whole game.
With that, the game is fine and complete. There's also infinite mode, which you spawn a random place with no items and can just mess around the mall. Psychopaths are in different places. I believe they spawn a random spots. Survivors will aggro the side of you and will drop items where they die. You're constantly losing health due to being infected. It's a fun little game mode if you enjoy the gameplay and just want to mess around. I like it, but I just don't have the patience. There's also Dead Rising, chop until you drop. It's just a Wii port using the Resident Evil 4 engine. It takes away a lot of the charm, since the Wii just can't handle what the original was. In the end, Dead Rising is a great game about the secret and disgusting side of the US government. They will do anything they want, and if it backfires, they will do anything in their power to hide it. It's a theme I always love seeing. Because seriously, the government is always hiding horrible things left and right. So a AAA game that goes mainstream that talks about this issue in such a way is incredible. I think that's what makes the story so unique. Just having the balls to show how the government is awful in a way that isn't far-fetched or extreme. They found a parasite and experiment to it, but they fucked up and killed everyone to hide away the truth. I doubt this kind of thing happens. Okay, maybe not with zombie parasites. But the government is always willing to hide the truth for the good image, and this game does a good job putting out the message. Also poking at consumerism in the US and how people just don't care about the world and just want to fill their bellies. Because in the end, the high class of society doesn't care who dies. They just care that their plates are full. It has great characters for what it is. The voice acting is amazing. And it's a very memorable game. It's so different from zombie games from its time. It's such a relief and honestly a diamond in the rough. With such a unique charm, unique art style, even if it's just realistic, it has that Japanese art style feel to it and makes it look great. The gameplay and design might have its issues, but it's fun when you overlook its flaws. If you're into games that you just kill a whole bunch, or games with a good story, or games with interesting and fun game mechanics, please give Dead Rising a try. There's a lot of things I haven't mentioned. For example, I haven't brought up all the survivors. Mostly because I kill them all. I don't want this video to be a replacement for your experience of the game. I wanted to talk about this game, which is a real forgotten gem. It used to be a 360 exclusive, but now there's a PC port on Steam for $20, and it's out for consoles with the triple package, which includes Dead Rising 1, 2, and Off the Records. It's definitely a game worth playing at least once, and there's a lot of content in it. Not only the story and psychopaths, but also the infinite mode and really tough achievements. This game is worth your attention, and Dead Rising is a series that died after its fourth entry. Capcom needs to know that there's people that love this kind of game, and that people want more. There hasn't been a game like it since. I would love a Dead Rising game that is faithful to its roots. Just like how Dead Rising was faithful to its own roots. Thank you for watching this long overdue video. Seriously, I've been working on this since November. I had to replay the game for the fourth time now for this video. I really did my best for this video and spent all my spare time working on it, even neglecting my needs and other games I need to finish so I could work on this video. But it's finally done, I can finally do these 50 gigabytes off my computer and be able to play Garfield Card in peace. I plan on making more videos in the future, I just really need to take a break from this since this really overworked me. I'm sorry the video is pretty slow between case 2 and 6. But those really only have side content and really short main story missions. So it was really hard to work with. So I had to resort to a lot of memes in those cases. I'm also sorry for my voice. I understand I have nasal voice and I wish I could do something about it. I plan on doing a retrospective on the rest of the series, especially Dead Rising 4. It's kind of the reason why I wanted to make this video. I wanted to talk about Dead Rising 4, but I felt like I should talk about the others to give more context and give myself a better insight into what exactly led to that disaster. Also, there's no real good video on YouTube about the Rising Force, so I kinda wanted to make one on my own style that I feel like people would really enjoy watching. Not a lot of people covered the Rising Force, sadly. I really don't know how to end this video. I have an art Twitter, at Stardust Abbey. I have a Twitch, which I stream sometimes. I don't have a Patreon or anything on the sort, but I do art commissions if anyone's interested in that. Shout out to Scoot the Bat for helping so much with the video. They proofread the script, helped with some of the points, helped a lot with editing. 
And they did the I love Jesus and my mom line for me. Thanks so much for all the help and support and getting me to keep making this video even when I thought of giving up. Well, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully I'll see you next time.